Good afternoon, very nice to see you. I, um, having just concluded before the break teaching a course considering the features of the law's interaction with the fact and meaning of, of human embodiment, I was of a frame of mind to elaborate some of those themes associated with that field of consideration as I took up my pen to pull together notes for today's presentation. Um, so there's our category. Um, I'll begin. In March of 1757, was contained the final and unfortunate hours of life of one Habert Francois Damion, who was tortured to death in France after his conviction as a regicide for his attempt on the life of Louis XV. At the end of a series of hideous impositions, poor Damion was quartered, a process that dragged out rather longer than anyone intended. Michel Foucault, when giving attention to certain of the unsettling details of this event, described quartering as a torture method that, quote, carries pain almost to infinity. Professor Elaine Scarry has written a sobering volume in which she evaluates generally the body in pain. And she begins that work with a chapter giving attention to the devilish and remarkably uniform and worldwide practice of torture. One of her themes is that the torturer's technique-driven technique imposition of pain on the body serves the purpose and effect of unmaking, of deconstructing the person, of robbing him of everything, even language, as he is reduced to primal groans. She elaborates that for the prisoner, the sheer, simple, overwhelming fact of his agony will make neutral and invisible the significance of any question put to him by his torturer as well as the significance of the world to which the question refers. Intense pain is world destroying, she says. As a result, she indicts the grave mistake made even by those who are appalled by torture and sympathetic to the victim. The mistake in making or maintaining a covert disdain for the tortured person's so-called betrayal or his incrimination of himself or others. This disdain, she says, is one of many manifestations of how inaccessible the reality of physical pain is to anyone not immediately experiencing it. Indeed, for one to import the category of judgment of betrayal into this context is to reveal an inapprehension of what is happening. She explains, one cannot betray or be false to something that has ceased to exist and in the most literal way possible, the created world of thought and feeling, all the psychological and mental content that constitutes both one's self and one's world, and that gives rise to and is in turn made possible by language, ceases to exist. Thus, in the torture victim's alleged betrayal, for him in the midst of his thick agony, to supposedly confess is, she says, for him to reach aimlessly for the name of a person or a place that has barely enough cohesion to hold its shape as a word and none to bond it to its worldly referent. The practiced and refined methods that are used to reduce a man to that condition will not consider today. But it is into this context of torture that the legal philosopher Jeremy Waldron has introduced an evocative discussion of the category of legal archetypes, one which I think helpfully illumines an aspect of the law's character and operation. That is, one of, the, that is of its systemic significance, of its substantive commitments, systemic both within the law itself as well as more broadly within the social order. The prohibition on torture is an international and domestic legal norm, appearing in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Convention Against Torture, the Third Geneva Convention relating to prisoners of war, uh, congressional statute, and otherwise domestically prescribed by various sources. Professor Waldron describes this prohibition on torture as an archetype in our law. And by archetype, he means, I quote him, a particular provision in a system of norms which has a significance stemming from the fact that it sums up or makes vivid to us the point, purpose, principle, or policy of a whole area of law. The archetypal torture prohibition is, Waldron writes, quote, emblematic of our determination to break the connection between law and brutality and to reinforce its commitments to human dignity, even when law is at its most forceful 
and its subjects are at their most vulnerable, end quote. While the rule against torture and its condemnation of brutality is an atmospheric that permeates all of the law, it also has the specific impact in our jurisprudence on, for instance, due process, the right against self-incrimination, and the interpretation of the Eighth Amendment's cruel and unusual punishment clause. Another prime example of an archetype in U.S. law is our habeas corpus statutes. Habeas corpus, you Latin speakers know, you have the body. The most famous and central of which is the habeas writ commanding a detaining official to bring the imprisoned person before a court to determine whether his detention is lawful. This great writ of liberty, as it is called, from our common law tradition and enshrined in federal and state constitutions and statutes is one that Waldron identifies as archetypal of our legal tradition's emphasis on liberty and freedom from physical confinement. It is also archetypal of the law's opposition to arbitrariness in regard to actions that have an impact on that right. The constant use of habeas corpus is, he says, seen as a way of slowly educating the bench, the bar, police, prosecutors, and the mass of citizens to the highest traditions of Anglo-American law. Also capable of serving as an archetype, archetypes are prominent judicial precedents. Uh, the Supreme Court's school de desegregation case of Brown versus Board of Education is iconic of the imperative to eliminate government-enforced racial segregation and other race-based diminishing. Then there's Roe versus Wade, which spectacularly reoriented the law's posture toward family, femininity, the child, and life itself, and the entire nation pivoted and reorganized in keeping with its grotesque meaning. A number of senators during judicial confirmation hearings spoke better than they knew when calling Roe not just a precedent, but a super precedent. Indeed, an archetype, I'd say, one whose resonances are present in every part of what I'll be discussing in a few minutes. Why the gravita gravitational pull of these totems? Undoubtedly explanatory for those I've mentioned are the profound matters they implicate and represent, matters of human embodiment. But I'm aiming here to emphasize the character and operation of law more generally that enables this archetype effect. The law is not a series of solitary posits directed at isolated events having no common root in conceptual interaction within itself. Rather, the law is a mutually informing whole with an effective imperative toward unity among its parts. This indeed is one of the defining characteristics of Western law and certainly the Anglo-American common law tradition with its emphasis on reason, doctrinal unity, precedent, and historical consistency. And so contestation over applications and extensions of the law presupposes this conceptually networked unity of the law and proceeds by putting forward arguments that are analogous to and reliant upon principles that are already established in the law is authoritative. So also the renunciation of an archetype is the renunciation of the principles that the archetype incorporated and held in place as authoritative conceptual pole stars superintending the relevant areas of law. These principles no longer have their authority upon the downing of the archetype. Thus our ability to make effective arguments rooted in the formerly governing principle vanishes. Conversely, those ideas that the former archetype during its reign had disqualified and kept beyond the gates, so to speak, now have entrance to rampage through the affected area of law, overhauling former standards and replacing them with its rival precepts. Indeed, they are veritably requ required to do so in view of the vacuum left by the dethroned predecessor. Such is the dynamic. How a society knows and remembers is a function of its cultural and also particularly legal institutions and the performances associated with them, which direct and sustain mores and structures of conceptual plausibility for the community. Upon altering or abolishing the legal standards that convey the central cultural narratives and replacing them with different models, our custodians of law and its institutions remap authorized pathways of thought for the community, which again means that certain ideas and arguments are disqualified from public operation and authority. 
And here we might consider the effect, <clears throat> excuse me, of decades of court-enforced exile of theological precept and reasoning from government institutions. This by means of the legally archetypal judicial rulings misinterpreting the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. This is that portion that reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Such judicial rulings, roughly summarized, uh, identified religion as a poison disrupting government's secular neutrality. And so government officials were forbidden to endorse religious precepts or otherwise have theological tenets serve as the purpose behind government conduct. Self-aware advocates of hegemony of secular liberalism well understood and understand the exclusion of theological points of reference from law and public reason not only trains the broader community into agnostic mental habits, it also creates a social environment leading religious adherents themselves to gradually doubt the objective truth or public relevance of their marginalized beliefs due to the persistent subliminal argument to that effect that is embedded in dominant and carefully curated social and legal discourse practice. The silence as to God and legal discourse at all points of official and often momentous state action is a powerful, incessant refutation of God's relevance, of his godness. So does Professor Stephen Macedo write, it is in this sense that liberalism might be said to silence the religious voice, not through direct censorship and the heavy hand of state oppression, but rather through a wide array of sometimes subtle expectations about appropriate forms of speech and reasoning, which amount to a system of unequal psychological taxation, sufficient to drive out certain patterns of deeply held belief and practice, not all at once, but over the course of generations. Here I'll propose, and some of you knew this would be coming, <clears throat> Another archetype of central legal significance, indeed the meta-archetype of anthropological meaning, is the humanly momentous and metaphysically loaded relation of husband and wife. While marriage had been assailed and weakened in law for decades by means of deviations from our historically connected legal standards treating sex and family, the more recent and explicit judicial and legislative overthrow of marriage itself by its redefinition has been a watershed of archetype renunciation. And this renunciation has invited a corresponding renovation of the fields of law and legal reasoning over which this monument to anthropological verities formerly had held sway. When the Supreme Court majority redefined civil marriage into a non-procreative and same-sex relation and status, it thereby renounced its form and meaning, transmogrifying it into its antithesis. The paradigm institution of our relationality, of our nuptial calling, of love manifest and revealed in generation, was jurisprudentially described and converted into a psychologically affirming tool and right of fruitless individuality. Upon the repudiation of the formerly universal legal norm of marriage, it appears untenable for the law to sustain through time the public place and meaning of all of the components and derivatives of family aspect and relationship. Once the marital center is dissolved, its adjacencies are set adrift from its defining and orienting authority. New definitions for each component become necessary and inevitable. Here I'll offer some illustrations that will be familiar to my students from last term. Since same-sex partnerships can only get children by the likes of purchase gametes, renting women as surrogates, or by legal transfers through adoption, not through sexual reproduction within the relationship itself, which is an impossibility, the common denominator now defining parenthood is and must be something like a selected and arranged custodial circumstance. It is not defined by, for it cannot be defined by, maternal and paternal procreative relation. And since, as the argument goes, categorically non-procreative relationships now represent the paradigm or central case of marriage and family in our governing constitutional law, it is urged that the collection and gathering of children unto such relationships from sources outside the relationship is likewise normative 
that is, likewise represents the new explanatory paradigm of family. With procreative relationality disqualified from defining the norms of marriage and family, the parent-child relation is redefined away from an embodied and immediate kinship bond into a management status of functional organization initiated by various technical methods or legal custody transfers. Thus, conjugal relation itself is reclassified into but one more method from the menu of legally equivalent functional means for obtaining children. That being the setup. Now on to our illustration. There are critics of non-conjugal child-making techniques who counsel against, for instance, the unregulated commerce of donor sperm. Among the risks from such commerce raised by proponents of regulation is that of accidental incest among donor-conceived children, this being an eventuality that is enabled by the proliferation within a geographical region of the offspring of a single sperm donor, a donor who may turn out to be the sire of multiple dozens of children. As these children grow up in the same area and later enter relationships of intimate Congress, they may be so engaged unwittingly with a sibling. Here enters law professor Courtney Cahill, who announces this concern to be one that is now disqualified, that is legally canceled. How so? Because, she explains, we are no longer allowed to call those donor-conceived offspring siblings. And as a result, the relationships among them cannot be classified as incestuous. For to treat biologically related persons as siblings or family members, which is what the accidental incest argument does, is to fail to see that the same-sex marriage archetype has cleaned house and discarded that former norm and category of family. That is, it has disqualified from legal acknowledgement the idea that genetically related persons from different households can be family members. As the central defining case of marriage and thus family, that is the same-sex couple, is categorically non-generative, kinship is not, cannot be, a defining feature of family relationality. She explains that on the new paradigm, donor-conceived children from a common progenitor cannot, on that basis, be siblings. So again, intimate relationships among them is not problematic and thus cannot present a constitutionally permissible reason to regulate gamete sales. You see. As she elsewhere has summarized, the marriage equality precedent paves the way for disestablishing not just traditional marriage, but also the traditional family, to which we can add the traditional understanding of human being. Though Professor Cahill is on this point several steps ahead of the law itself as well as ahead of community sensibilities and otherwise wrong about the practical authority of Supreme Court rulings, I appreciate her insight into the significance of an archetype replacement in law and thus what will be entailed once the new archetype consolidates its control over the dissident policy fragments surviving from the former corpus of family law. Other scholars of prominence have in similar form observed that the redefinition of civil marriage into a same-sex relationship invites us not only to eliminate the mother-father unity as being together the parental offices, but that the elimination of biology and gender as salient considerations from family likewise removes the temple, template of two persons serving as the parental, in the parental role, or that those who are deemed parents of a child should be in an intimate relationship with each other to begin with. And in keeping with that theme, the revised Uniform Parentage Act of 2017, which has been enacted in six states, last I checked, in its editorial preface explains that this model legislation intends to eliminate and replace most all historic family law standards that depend on or imply the archaic idea that male and female, mother and father, are meaningful categories or relations for children or are relevant or instructive for the law. So here again, the former normative family definition of procreative relation is now disqualified for everyone. Courts, agencies, executives, and legislative bodies across the country have been facilitating the manufacture and custodial possession of children through techniques and purchase, all justified as being implied in, thus required by, 
the Supreme Court's imposition of a new gay paradigm of family. Now, it is an aspect of the law's responsibility to maintain its own coherence and doctrinal unity, not just by preserving internal to itself its carefully virtuous orienting standards, but also by foreclosing certain malevolent practices in society whose, continue, whose tolerated continuance would sow chaos into the community and disrupt its orienting self-understanding, which in turn would in time threaten features of the law itself, which would thereafter repay harm to the community and so on in mutual returns. Friedrich Stahl, the 19th century German statesman and scholar and Jewish convert to Christianity, urged that the law is responsible to protect the divinely established vocations and institutions within and comprising the community, not in order to compel virtuous perfections or attainments within each one, but rather, quote, to preserve its most outlying boundaries, only enough to preserve the concept, to keep its opposite from manifesting itself. Pierre Manon likewise suggested something to the effect of, law is to hold together what belongs together and which needs assistance to hold together. Because of that responsibility to protect and preserve vital aspects defining and comprising community order, the law's silence or inaction in the face of deviant social practices works as their accelerant because the conditions of protection and regulation that law provides are themselves part of the proper human participation in the created order through which social associations and institutions such as the family find their safe habitus. The marauders are to be kept at bay. Public standards and structures pertaining to, for example, sex and family are not optional. They are obligatory in the composition of the just social order. Thus, the occasional proposal to privatize marriage and family is radically mistaken. Since human meaning can never be privatized, when we take these explanatory and defining relationships of human existence out of public status and convert them into private options, Persons become, for public purposes, no longer familial in essence and meaning. They are instead reduced to entities whose essence is as detached pre-social units that will things. Therein a revolutionary redefinition of the human person. Professor Crawford has written that if juridical forms and civil institutions are not to be alienating and fragmenting, they need to anticipate and support the concrete person as he really is, rather than, as, rather than a hypothetical and denatured person. As such, the juridical forms and civil institutions embodying legal justice must presuppose in their structure, meaning, and ends, the familial person and the human justice he or she represents and aspires to. By way of contrast, in considering our earlier discussion of the redefined family, once the lab coat and lawyer superintended multiple party technological child production methods receive state approval to operate or otherwise face no legal impediment to doing so, which amounts to the same thing for the reasons just explained, with this unregulated practice comes the ascendancy of the idea that children are properly projects for construction, retrieval, and negotiated possession. This converts the nature of the child from a providential arrival who manifests the fruitful meaning of nuptial love and who is bound in meaningful relationships to forebears, instead now as an item to be made and later distributed to whomsoever the now obviously cooperating state authorizes. Thus, the child is not just mechanically constructed, he ends up bureaucratically determined, being placed with caregivers in terms of the new functional logic that replaces the natural, filial, relational logic that grounds our legal tradition. The child custody question is resolved now, not in terms of who, but of what. The what being the utilitarian service of caregiving an act whose fulfillment, so long as it's managerially adept, is agnostic as to the who that would serve in the role. The law's regulatory absence, its alleged privatizing of human relationality, thus meaning, advances a very public 
alternative anthropology and the state feigning a non-committal stance on human meaning by privatizing the matter has shown itself inhuman, all in keeping with the new orienting paradigm that Reed describes us. So here I conclude. The time lag, the interval between adoption into law of a ruinous precept and its completed proliferation or instantiation in enforced rules may lull us into believing that logical consistency and policy consequence will not, after all, follow. But the continuing familiarity in the main of our lived moments and legal traditions are naturally part of the early schedule and a legal shift of civilizational scope. Indeed, this delay in observable consequence facilitates the consolidation into law of the new precepts that have been advertised as harmless and peripheral. They're not. The poison takes time to assimilate throughout the body politic and to overcome the venerable habits and conventions in law and outside of it, militating against its novelties. Its work is tenacious, for as we've been considering this afternoon, the law is not an aggregation of disconnected wishes, but an organism that ever strives to bring its various features into unity with its command precepts. Thus does argumentation in the law move in terms not of isolated wish or judgment, but of conformity to principles already installed in positions of central significance. It is vital, then, that we forecast effects and pursue the arrest of alien archetypes during the time of their relative dissonance before they can extend and attain to the security of a systemic consistency. There is yet time, abundant legal precedent, systemic inconsistency, and compelling reason for the law and the rest of us to return to the task of protecting the real relations and institutions of human meaning and of community order. We must understand the conflagration that is our time, and as Sorokin says, perhaps shorten its tragic period and mitigate its ravages. Let us be about that noble work, Lord helping us. Thank you.